have your Bibles, the book of Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, and we'll pick up verse number one, and we started a series this Wednesday called Storyteller, and it's about the parables of Jesus, and we talked a little bit about the parables from chapter, from Matthew last time, and, and we're going to get into the parables in Luke here in just a minute, Luke chapter 15. We're going to talk about the parables of lost things, the parables of lost things, and Luke 15 and 1 says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. He was even eating with them. So Jesus told them a story. Father, speak to us this morning in a, in a powerful way. Help us be receptive to your word in, in Jesus' name. And why don't we give the Lord one more big hand clap before we're seated today. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you, God. We lift you up in this place. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. <clears throat> and you can be seated. And as I said, we're going to talk about the parables of lost things. And have you ever lost something? I mean, like something really valuable, something that you really cared about, like, like maybe a kid. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, Corey and I took the boys. Graham was about four, and we went to Wilderness in the Smokies. It's kind of like Great Wolf Lodge, and they love to swim. They love water slides, and, and in the midst of all the chaos with all of the people that were there, we turned around, and Graham was gone. And we searched and searched, and, and Corey quickly got the, the volunteers or the workers there involved, and they began to search, and I ran out in the parking lot, stopped the bus, like it was a big deal. We were, we were trying to find the lost kid, and uh, he liked the little pool that makes waves, and so he's just chilling over there in the wave pool, trying not to be seen, blending in with everybody else, and, and that's where we find him, but I, I, I know we're, we're terrible parents, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've lost a kid or two uh, if you're a parent as well. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's terrifying when you, when you can't find your, your kid. And Jesus knew that people would identify with the desperate feeling of losing something valuable. That's why he taught so much about lost things. And he even said, I've not come to seek and save those that are well. I've come for the lost and, and the sick. I, that, that's my purpose and my mission for being here. And in Luke, I, I love the way Luke strings these parables together. And, and he, he does this with three lost things. And we, we see the desperation of a shepherd who's lost one of his sheep. And we see the desperation of a woman who's lost a valuable coin. And then we see the desperation of a father who's lost a son to the world, and, and he's gone outside of the house doing things that he shouldn't do. And, and as Duran says in the podcast, and, and let me just give you a shameless, uh, shameless plug here for the podcast. If you don't check out What's the Point podcast, you need to check it out. Uh, we, we break down the word from every Sunday and, and discuss it, try to give you some practical application that you can put in your everyday life. So check that out. You can get it straight from... The, the website point.church or the, the Point Church app or your favorite media uh, podcast outlet. You can get it from there, but I believe it would really help you. But Duran always says spoiler alert, and he, he tells us something that's going to happen at the end from the beginning. And, and here's the spoiler alert is that in the stories of Jesus, the sheep is rescued. The coin is rediscovered, and, and the, the father gets the son to come back home and and I don't know about you, but I find comfort in that because as crazy as life gets, as frustrating as life can be, I can feel really lost at times. And I'm so thankful to be serving a God that values lost things. It's important to point out that in the Hebrew oratory tradition, storytellers often spoke in threes. And the first two stories were, were, were just kind of small stories that were setting up the big story at the end. And that's what Jesus has done here. It, it's kind of like when you go to the restaurant and they bring out the chips and salsa. And then you know you've got to have the queso next. It, it's, the, it's the second. And then there, there comes the, the main entree. The, the big enchiladas are coming next. It's, it's kind of what Jesus did. He's setting the table with two little stories 
And I want to look at those stories, the sheep, the coin, and the, the, the lost son, or we call it the prodigal son. And remember last week we talked about this, con this concept that context gives meaning. And so I want to look at the context that we're talking about this, the reasons why Jesus told this parable. Jesus told these parables because two groups had gathered before him. On one side, there were the publicans and the sinners, those who knew that they didn't have it all together. And on the other side, there were the Pharisees, those who thought they had it all together and were doing everything the way they were supposed to do. And, and the one group, the Pharisees, I'll, I'll say this half is, is the Pharisees, and, and I'm just, just, just go with me here. This half is the Pharisees, don't get offended. And, and this half of, of the church will be the publicans and the sinners. And, and Jesus is talking to the publicans and the sinners, and the Pharisees get really upset because, oh my gosh, he is talking and he's even eating with these people. And, and Jesus decides, I, I, I love Jesus, man. Instead of getting upset and mad and, and, and like us sometimes, he don't go to Facebook and start angrily posting stuff. He says, let me tell you a story. And the storyteller goes to work. And, and now these two groups of people are here and Jesus is, is trying to reach both groups. And so I may get a little bit controversial for a moment, but, but that's okay. I'm good with that. I, I believe I'm in the will of God for this, so just hear me out. But it's scary because in these two groups, I think the Pharisees are probably the people that most of us in the room would more easily identify with. Now, we never admit that because after all, we know the end of the story. We know that the Pharisees are the enemies of God and they're trying everything they can to resist Jesus. But at the time, you have to understand, they don't know that. They think that they're right in their understanding of everything that they're doing, and they think that they're, they're right in the way that they live, and they're doing everything they can to stop Jesus because they don't think that he is, is, is right in what he's doing. And, and so we, we resist the idea of that because we know the end of the story, but, but I want to look at these comparisons realistically and, and, and be serious. Put on your thinking cap and, and just look at the comparison because when you look at the Pharisees, they are very religious. They, they adhere to a long list of rules that they're doing the best they can to honor God by doing that. They, they diligently serve the kingdom of God the way that they understand it. They, they bring their tithes and their offerings willingly. They pray a lot. They fast a lot. They visit the temple so much that they pretty much live there. They've trusted their entire lives and their, their families to their understanding of God and Talk about study the word, man. They are word people through and through. By the time they were 12 to 14 years old, everyone, or just about every one of the men would have been able to quote the entire Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, word for word. I mean, they were word people. They were different. They were set apart. They were peculiar. Other religions didn't have their understanding of, of the one God revelation. Other denominations couldn't boast of their powerful and miraculous history from their origin. You impressed yet? I mean, these people were the real deal. So far, it sounds great. Of course, I identify with them. They sound awesome. But here's the danger that Jesus keeps running into with them. And the reason why he resists them so much is because they focused more on the rituals of religion than anything else. They became performance-based people. And the problem with performance is that when you live the performance long enough, Pretty soon you start to buy into the role and a performance-based experience usually leads to elitism like, like maybe I am a step above everybody else and, and so that's why I sit on one side and I look down at other people that Jesus is trying to reach because maybe I am better. Let me, let me try it like this. When, when I was recovering from the surgery I had, uh, when I, they removed the cancer, I was in the hospital for a few days, and when I could finally eat after a few days, Corey brought me uh, baked chicken from Pollo Loco. And the other day, uh, Sister Pavlou and, and Corey were talking, and they were talking about the Mexican restaurant that is right next to Taco Sisters on Johnston Street. And I'm thinking, the Mexican restaurant, the only thing I know there is Pollo Loco. And so I say, that's a Mexican restaurant? Well, yeah. I've missed out on an entire experience. I had no idea they had burritos and, and, and nachos and, and street tacos because all I ever knew was, was baked chicken, kind of bland baked chicken. And 
what I'm trying to say is that experience usually influences understanding. Experience influences understanding. And so when the majority of my experience is performance-based, then it's too easy to unintentionally start looking down at other people whose performance doesn't measure up to mine. You know, look down at the people who don't quite live like I do, who don't quite pray as much as I do or worship as hard as I do. It's, it's easy to get aggravated with other Christians who don't seem to care as much or give as much or, or want God as much in their life because my experience influences my understanding. And, and pretty soon my experience, my thoughts, my interactions, my performance becomes the lens through which I view everyone else. And the Pharisees had developed this elitist attitude. And the problem with elitism is it leads to judgmentalism. And that's why they were so dogmatic. You have to see this. They were so dogmatic in their doctrine that God of the universe had donned the, the, the robes of flesh and was walking among them and they could not recognize him because he wasn't going by their rules and he wasn't playing by their understanding and he wasn't doing the way that, that they thought he should. And so they missed the man and they mislabeled his miracles. They misunderstood his mission because he didn't live the way that they did and he was not interested in their performance. I don't want your performance. Jesus says, I've got two groups here. I've got publicans and sinners and I'm reaching for them but I'm also reaching over here for the Pharisees because I've got to get you to understand I'm not interested in your performance. I want your heart. I want your heart. And, and basically what Jesus is trying to say is I've got two groups and both are equally lost. And I've got to get them both to understand that they're equally lost so that, that they can discover everything that's going to be found in me. Not in a doctrine or a religion. That's what they've always had. But I've come so that they could know me so that I could give them life. The letter kills, but I've come to, to give life. I, I want you to experience something more than just the hardness of, of trying to, to follow rules and regulations. Yes, it's necessary and important, but you can't just do that and miss me. I want you to experience me. And so he says, let me tell you a story. Luke chapter 15 and verse number four says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he'll joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed. And this is important because sheep had significant value in, in Jewish culture. And so when Jesus begins to talk about a lost sheep, it immediately pulls them in because economically, historically, agriculturally, it, it had significance to them. And so Jesus begins to talk about 100 sheep, 99 are safe, but one has kind of wandered out on his own. And, and, and we would think, well, what's the big deal? You still have 99. I mean, it's not that, that big of a deal, but Jesus says, wouldn't you leave the 99 and go after the one that is lost? And this word lost in the context of the original language is very interesting because it doesn't just mean that the sheep has misplaced himself or he has, he, he's confused about where he is. It's, it's a word that literally means he's in great danger. He's headed toward destruction unknowingly. And so Jesus paints this bleak picture of this sheep and immediately pulls the master storyteller, pulls the audience in with, with this, this cliffhanger that he's, that he's teaching. This little lamb is, is gone on his own and he's, he's lost. He's, he's heading toward disaster. It's like if you've ever seen a scary movie and you know something bad's about to happen, one of the characters is doing something that they should, should never do or would really do in real life, hopefully. And I have a confession. There was one time a few years ago where people recommended this cute little movie for kids and, and the boys were small. It was, it was terrifying. It started off with the mom being viciously killed and the little boy being hurt and then in a cruel tryst, halfway through the story, the kid gets kidnapped and he's trapped and the dad has to try to find him with the help of this girl who doesn't have a memory. 
And it, 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 yeah, it was, it was pretty terrifying. And, and Philip Spence was, was watching with us, and he's screaming at the little boy the whole movie, just adding to the intensity. He's like, watch out, don't do it. Don't go in there. You'll be eaten. Nemo! Nemo! I mean, the little dude was helpless. He never should have wandered off. He should have listened to Philip. He was lost. He was lost. Heading toward destruction without knowing it. And again, spoiler alert, it all worked out in the end. He was rescued. It was crazy. The, the little girl with braces didn't do him harm. He, he survived just your everyday average Disney film. But that's the image of this sheep. It's in trouble. It has no chance. Such powerful imagery by the master storyteller. And the shepherd goes on. He went after the lost sheep. And I love verse 4. He searches until he finds him. I'm, I'm not giving up on the search. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to search until he finds him. And, and when he finds him, he joyfully puts him on his shoulders and carries him back home. There, there's no judgment. There's no, you should have done it better. There's no punishment, no, no anger or frustration. I'm just, I'm just glad to, to get you back home. And then he's like, and, and there's this great celebration. He calls all his friends together. There's some Zotico music playing in the background, a little Cajun beat, and they're all dancing. It's a party because my lost sheep has returned. And I love this story because we learn here that every sheep is valuable. Every sheep is valuable. The only reason this one sheep is, is even mentioned is because it was lost. If another sheep would have been mentioned, he would have been the star of the story. But, but every sheep had equal value. And so this sheep is pointed out because it's a lost sheep, which also tells me that although every sheep is equally valued, the lost sheep is prioritized. I'm going to leave the, the 90 and 9, and I'm going to prioritize the one that's lost. And this tells me that church is, is really about the lost. It's, it's what Jesus was trying to get across to these two groups. He's, he's looking at the, the, the church people, if you will, and he's saying, but, but you've got to understand, it's really about the lost. It's why I'm here. It's about the lost. And, and we say that sometimes, church is about the lost, and, and then people kind of get upset. Well, what about me? What about me? What, what about me? I, I'm living for God, and I'm not, not, uh, I'm not uh, lost. Uh, you know, church should be for me. And, and I never kind of understand that. I'm just being honest with you. I don't understand that. I think maybe it's, it's a perspective difference because some may see themselves as saved, but, but I still see myself in desperate need of a Savior. Some may see themselves as already making it, but, but I see myself as messed up and desperately needing a God who, who loves lost things and, and who prioritizes lost things. And, 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 and I'm glad that Point Church is a, is a church that prioritizes lost because if it didn't, I wouldn't be here. I need a church and I need a God who loves lost things. And so then Jesus goes into the next story, this parable of lost coins and Verse 8, he says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God angels when one sinner repents. And I love it here because he, he goes into this dialogue that's almost following the example of the sheep and one thing I read said it was a day's wage that she had lost, and I thought, well, that's not really that big of a deal. I mean, it, it would hurt, but, but I'm not going to go throw a big party and call all my friends if I, if I rediscover the one day's wage. So what's the big deal here? And most theologians or historians agree that, that this coin represented at the marriage when the, the groom would come to the bride, he would give her a necklace of coins that had 10 coins in it, and, and it was a very symbolic and powerful thing, much like a wedding ring today, but with much more symbolism tied into it. It was, it was a, a big deal. If she lost this coin, it was a sign that she was no longer faithful. If she lost one of these coins or the necklace was broken or misplaced, it was a sign that, that the covenant between them wasn't as special to her, that she hasn't treasured it as much. And so it's not just a lost coin. It's a sign of her devotion to her husband, her, her devotion to her spouse. And so when she finds that one of them is misplaced, she is diligently searching because she doesn't want him to think that he no longer matters. And she's searching. And I love the story because what we find is that just because something's lost doesn't mean it's lost its value. 
Sometimes, sometimes we think that, well, well, so and so's gone. It, it's, it's, well, we'll just, we'll just move on. But, but, but no, no, Jesus said, just because it's lost, it hasn't lost its value. It's, it's worth looking for. It's worth rediscovering. It's, it's worth going after. It's worth lighting the lamp and getting on your hands and knees and dusting out the cobwebs. The Bible says she goes through the dirt and the dust. She's, she's looking everywhere for this coin. I love this story because it also tells us that true value is defined by ownership. In, in elementary school, my sister bought me this Dallas Cowboys pencil, and she, I was probably fourth or fifth grade. She was like third grade, and, and she sacrificed her little bit of, of money and bought something for me instead of for her, so it meant something to me. And I had it for a day, and then I lost it on the playground, and I was devastated. And I went to the teacher when I realized it was lost, and I told her, I've got to go back outside. And of course, the teacher automatically thinks, well, he's just trying to get back outside. And, and I'm like, no, no, I, you don't understand. I've got to go find this pencil, <laughs> a, a pencil. And so she, she let me go, and, and I went outside, and I never found it. <laughs> and, and some of you are thinking, it's a Dallas Cowboys pencil. Hopefully, it's in the trash. And uh, that, that's okay. I know where I'm at. Uh, I'm in Saints territory. That's, that's good. Just be careful. Remember, you don't, you don't have Drew Brees anymore. So just, just be careful what, you, what, you, what trash you talk now. Uh, but what we learn is that ownership is important. I was the owner of the pencil, and it had certain memories attached. It had, had certain feelings attached. It, it had value not because of what it was actually worth, but because of what it meant to me, and, and I've come to tell you that when Jesus looks at you, it, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world sees because he's already paid the price for you. He's already determined that, that your value is set and you're, 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 you're priceless. You're priceless. He thought you were, as the song says, he thought you were to die for. You're, you're, you're priceless. And so then he goes into this parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, and that word prodigal means wasteful or extravagant, wasteful or extravagant. And the son, if you don't know the story, I'll just summarize it real quick. There's, the Bible said there's a man that has two sons, and one of them, the younger, says he dishonors the father by saying that he wants his inheritance ahead of time, and so the father agrees, and he gives him the inheritance. He, he goes and he extravagantly spends every bit of the money just wasted on what the Bible says riotous living, and he, he spends all of the money, and then a famine comes, and now he's got nothing to sustain himself. And so he starts starving. He goes and gets a job, which no Jew would ever do at a pig pen. It's illegal, and he, but, he, but it's the only thing he can find. And so he's just trying to make it, trying to survive. And he's in the pig pen eating the, the things that the pigs are eating. And then one day he has this moment where he comes to himself and says, you know, even the servants at my father's house have it better than this. I know I wronged my father, but, but I could just go back to my father's house. Surely I could get a job as a servant, and at least I could live. But he doesn't know, but the father's been standing looking the entire time, and he sees the son coming and, and runs to him like no man that had any dignity would ever do in that culture. But he runs because he's not worried about being dignified. He's prioritizing lost things. And, and he runs to the, the man and, and embraces him and restores him to the family. Now, remember, there's two groups of people, and the publicans and sinners can identify with that group. But now Jesus launches into the story about a second son who is on the outside looking in. And when the father throws a party for the son who's returned, the second son is upset, and he's mad, and the father has to come out of the house and talk to him, and he's like, but I've served you all this time, and you never threw me a party. You never did anything for me, and the father's like, man, everything in my house is yours. Like, like you, you own it all. What, what are you crying for? And then Jesus stops the story, and it's such a powerful story because we learn, first of all, that the kingdom brings correction. The kingdom brings correction. If you can't be corrected, you, you, you can't succeed. Both types of sons had their own expectations of what the father should do for them, and the youngest sons may have manifested itself in a worldly way, and the, the older sons manifested itself more in a faithful way, but, but both of them missed the point completely. We, we see in this story that you can be in the father's house and not have the father's heart. You can 
be in the church and not have the mindset of the kingdom. And Jesus comes teaching that the kingdom will bring correction. The kingdom, when it comes to your life, is going to begin to line things out that you thought you had figured out, but, but the kingdom says, oh, no, no, that's not the way it goes at all. You need to get in, in alignment with, with what I'm doing. And if you'll align yourself with, with what I'm doing, your life will be better. You've got to align yourself to the kingdom. And Jesus was basically saying, are you willing to make adjustments to your life? He's looking at both groups, the sinner's and the church, are you willing to make the adjustments necessary to get to the level that I'm trying to bring you to? And this is, is, is crazy because we also learn that what you will not learn from instruction, sometimes God will teach you through experience. He's like, fine, son. Fine. You, 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 you're, not gonna, you're not gonna live it right? Okay, fine. Do, do what you want. He gives him all this money and says, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you what you're asking for. You're not ready for it yet. You're not mature enough yet, but okay. You haven't learned from all the years of my instruction. Now you're going to learn from experience. And sometimes we say, God, I don't understand why you would allow this to come into my life. And, and I'm just going to say sometimes because it's not all the time. It's, it's not the rule. It's just sometimes. But, but sometimes in God's mercy, he allows trouble to come into our life. Because here's a truth that we don't talk about, but, but often the immature have to stay in crisis to stay connected. The immature has to learn how to handle success and how to walk in the blessing. The immature sometimes need a fight to stay focused and to stay faithful. And so sometimes God will allow a problem to come into your life and, and will withhold sustained success and prolonged blessing because your salvation is more important than your success. And your soul is more valuable than your satisfaction. So God will do whatever it takes to keep you coming back to him. Sometimes we've, we've just got to reevaluate and say, okay, what are you trying to, to teach me through this experience? Because if I learn this lesson, better things are coming. We also learn that personal selfish pursuits will leave you empty and alone and to quote our very own uh, Danielle Angel, who, who made this great Facebook pro post on the book of Ecclesiastes a couple of days ago. And I'm just going to quote verbatim, verbatim, uh, verbatim because it was really good. It, she said, David's son plainly tells of how life really is, how it always has been, and how it always will be. In most of his chapters, he says how everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. It really makes you understand that the things of this world are truly worth nothing. And that the only thing that matters is fearing God and obeying his commandments. Man, just, just beautiful words. And, and, and this young man in the story, here he is pursuing selfish desires. And, 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 and we learn that when you pursue selfish desires, it always leaves you empty. I want to tell you also, be patient with the process because... Often selfishness leads to dissatisfaction, and then that dissatisfaction leads to impatience. The son wanted it now, and the father's like, son, because of your impatience, what could have sustained you for a lifetime will only sustain you for a season. Your lack of faith in what I was forming in you is going to forfeit the favor that would have lasted forever, but you wanted it now. You weren't patient with the process, and now it all falls and crumbles at your feet and and then just look at the person next to you and tell, look at look at the person next to you and tell them snap out of it just snap out of it now y'all y'all didn't do that near as good as I thought you would look at the person on the other side of you and do put a little bit of pizzazz and like like snap out of it uh, yeah that's a that's a little bit better snap out of it we all have to come this to this moment in life where we snap out of it where the Bible says he came to himself and, and he realized that, you know what, man, I am lost. I have no idea how I got here or where I'm at. I never intended to be in this place, but, but I remember back at my father's house. And remember, Jesus is speaking to two groups. One is still in the father's house and he's, he's so powerfully still speaking this is you can still be lost even in the father's house. You gotta come to this moment that, that even where I'm at, I'm lost. 
God, just give me new direction. God, just, just, just help me find my way back to, to not just, just a religion or, or not just a performance, but God, help me find my way back to you. You know, Jesus knew that sometimes we could identify with the feeling of the desperate feeling of losing something valuable. But if we're honest, he also knew that sometimes we could identify with the feeling of being lost. Corey and I, many years ago, got lost in the woods. I'll make a long story short. We got lost in the woods, and, and in the middle of this, this lost episode, we, we are walking, and there's mud, and, and you can see huge, I mean, huge um, mountain lion tracks that are fresh. They're, they're in the mud, and so we know that th this dude is in this area, and I'm thinking, what's rule number one if you cross a mountain lion? It's like, I don't have to be fast. I just have to be faster than you. And <laughs> so, <laughs> Relax, man. I'm just joking. I would never do that. I don't think. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So so we're we're terrified. And, and long story short, we're both still here. So we didn't have to run. We 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 made it out. We found found our way out. Thank thank God. And uh, then there's the time I've told you with me and Cody getting lost in the woods. And now that I think about it, maybe there's a common denominator here. You don't want to you don't want to go in the woods with me. Uh, but yeah, the younger son sets off on his own and. And he starts living this, what the Bible says, extravagant lifestyle. He's lost, and he's living it up. And the sad reality is that some people won't get better because they enjoy the attention too much. And sometimes in public speaking, you just kind of pause because you, you, you want that to kind of sink in. As a matter of fact, I even put pause for effect. <laughs> because you, you, you need a pause right here because some people won't get better because they enjoy the attention too much. And until you crave absolution as much as you crave attention, you're going to remain in your affliction. Until you pursue the anointing more than the affirmation that you get from being broken, you're, you're going to remain in your affliction. And, and so this moment of self-realization has to come. We also learn that comparison creates a defective reality. The, the, the son says, you never did this for me. And now he thinks he's been slighted. He thinks it's not fair. And the father has to remind him, Dude, chill out. Like, everything in my house belongs to you. Like, like, like you're all out of, you're, you're been out of shape over nothing. It all belongs to you. And the son's like, but, but I've worked, I've stayed, and he didn't do any of that. He, he left, and he's partied it up and lived any way he wanted. And, and now you're, does that sound familiar? Sound familiar, maybe? If we're honest, most of us have, have, have been to this place in our life, and it's interesting, I want to point out, because that word served, I've served you in the Greek, it, it doesn't mean like I've, I've worked and, and made a wage, or, or I've, I've, what, it, what it really means is I've been your slave, I've slaved for you. It's, it's obligation only, it's not love, it's not respect, it's not a typical father-son relationship. What he's saying is, is I've served you, but Jesus is pointing this, this word play, the master storyteller, man, he's pointing this out of, of this son's idea of, of I've did it, I've done it out of obligation. I've done it because I had to. And we see, we think that the son had a jealousy issue, but I'm going to submit that the issue was much deeper than jealousy, and it started long before the brother's party. He lived it only out of obligation, and obligation led to anger when he didn't get what he thought he deserved. And the master brings this to the head, to the religious elitist, elitist. He wants to know, what is your motive? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why have you really followed all the rules? Why have you put so much into your performance when your heart is still prideful and selfish your obligatory service has only led to entitlement you think you deserve because somehow you think you are better but you have failed to understand you can be in the house and still be lost you can attend every service and still not be saved you can be just as lost as those that are in the world that I'm so desperately trying to reach. And then I love how Jesus ends the, the, the story, and he doesn't just end it in, in the, the, the story of the father and the son. He ends it this way with all three parables. At the end, let, I'm just going to tell you, let's, let's party. Let's party. All of them had a party when they were found. And, and what, what I want to tell you there is that in every service, as we all stand, in every service, 
I have a choice to make. I can come to the party or I can stand on the outside looking in. Let me, let me just give you a little insight into group pastor Jonathan. Let me, let me tell you why I worship the way I do. I worship the way I do because I know I'm not worthy to be in his presence. I worship the way I do because I know it's only by his grace that I am here. I, I worship the way I do because I know that he's worthy no matter what I'm going through. I worship the way I do because can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. I, I worship the way I do because he's my friend. I worship like this because I'm not here out of obligation. I'm not here because I have to be. I'm here because he is the king and he is the Lord and he is worthy of all of my praise. I'm here because he's been too good to me to just sit silent. I'm here because he has been so good and faithful in my life and he deserves so much more than I could ever give. I'm here because he's worthy. And please hear me. I'm here because if all of heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. I've just got this, this notion that me and heaven's going to have a party. I'm not, I'm not going to let heaven party with somebody else. I'm, I'm going to come and I'm going to repent and God make me right, create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. God, I, I want to be right in your eyes. I, I don't just want the performance. I want to really be right. Let's have a party. And, and I'm going to close with this. We, we call this story the prodigal son, but, but that's not really what Jesus called it. He didn't give it a label. But in Jewish tradition, the first character mentioned was most often the star or the main character of the story and so let me read verse 11 again to illustrate the point further Jesus told them this story a man had two sons he he gives the emphasis to the father remember the word prodigal it, it means extravagant it means wasteful and I believe the story is more about the prodigal father than it is about the prodigal son what what do you mean I'm I'm telling you that the father was so generous with his grace that that others would look at it and say oh he's he's wasting his grace on on a son that that left him and a son that despised him but but the father's grace is so extravagant that, that he says I don't care how far you've strayed or I don't care how bad you've hurt me I don't care what you've done I love you so much and my grace and my love is so extravagant that I just want you to come back home and so this morning whether you're a publican or whether you're a sinner, I'm going to ask you to come to the front and just make this commitment to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, I just, I just want to truly connect today. God, I don't want to just go home and be on the outside looking in. God, I really want to be part of the party. Let's come right now and lift him up. Let's begin to magnify the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Our prayer ministers are here. If you have any need, come on and and God's going to move in your life right now. Thank you, Jesus.
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.